Hello, I'm Rachel Frick, the Executive Director of OCLC's Research Library Partnership, and welcome to this session, Circulating Optimism. In this presentation, we will bring together stories about what we have learned and observed through the activities of the networks and programs we support and share information regarding efforts OCLC has launched as a result. We will highlight how we have seen libraries of all types strive to learn, share, connect, adapt, and innovate during this turbulent time. In a recent convening, this quote from Antarctic explorer Ernest Shackleton, optimism is true moral courage, was noted. Through our library networks at OCLC, we see this moral courage, this optimism in action as librarians respond to the global health crisis, as they think about the future of libraries and library services, and find new opportunities to engage with their communities. In sharing these stories of resilience, innovation, compassion, and community, we hope to provide support for library staff as they adapt to rapidly changing sets of circumstances. But please note, we are not asking our viewers to don on rose-colored glasses and take an overly cheerful point of view, but rather one of clear-eyed, realistic optimism, grounded in facts and with the knowledge that we are stronger together. It is our hope that although we may be in different boats weathering this particular storm, by sharing these stories, you may find some fellow travelers to sustain you, minimizing feelings of being isolated or overwhelmed. We hope that knowing that we are investing resources to seek out science-based protocols for handling materials safely, you have confidence to reopen our libraries, that they can be done in a way that protects our communities and our frontline staff. Together as we strive to leave, balancing the demands of now with planning for the future, we hope these stories can give insight on how others are setting priorities and thinking about life in two years time. We have found it steadying to focus on the same point on the horizon, to aim our ships, aligning our efforts towards the same goal of providing support for the sustainable future of libraries. For it is imperative that libraries as institutions and li the library community emerge from this well, stable, and strong so that we in turn can extend a hand and support others. Joining me in this presentation are my colleagues, Marilee Prophet, the Senior Manager of OCLC Research Library Partnership, who will be describing the partnership work, holding space for members to connect and inspire. Saren Streams, the Director of Web Junction, will be providing details regarding the research partnership between the Institute of Museum and Library Services, Battelle, and OCLC to create and distribute science-based information and recommended practices designed to reduce the risk to the transmission of COVID-19 to staff and visitors who are engaging in the delivery or use of museum, library, and archival services. And wrapping up today is Lynn Silipini conaway the Director of Library Trends and User Research, who will tell us more about her research regarding the new model library. I'm going to kick things off telling you a few stories about how libraries are learning and sharing. As libraries have closed their physical spaces and adapted services to remote work, we've seen library staff spend more time than ever on professional development and online learning. In a poll conducted during the recent OCLC virtual town hall, 81% of attendees reported that they have engaged in more professional development since the beginning of COVID-19 pandemic. As a free resource that is open to all, Web Junction has long been the learning place for libraries. But the increase we've seen in time spent learning on webjunction.org between March and April 2020 has been, put simply, extraordinary. March and April saw a record-setting spike in Web Junction course catalog usage. In fact, it was a 650% increase in users and a 1,791% increase in the hours spent learning. We had more learners in Web Junction's catalog in the month of April alone as we've had during all of last year. Customer service is the content is the biggest draw with the course cultivating protective factors for safe libraries and resilient communities being in the top 10 along with service excellence in challenging times, and another course entitled Reducing Workplace Stress. In addition to customer service and staff support topics, we have observed a market uptake on resources dealing with operational workflows like AV transcription, metadata remediation, digital collections processing, and rights management. With a shift to working at home, many are restructuring work for those whose jobs were reliant on tasks associated with managing physical collections. 
We have seen an increase of libraries' attention to managing digital resources, refining workflows around licensed e-content, creating digitized primary source sets for in-classroom use, to targeting backlogs of collection description, and overall description enhancement and remediation. Our Content DM Community Center group has increasingly been active with robust attendance for workflow webinars to answering the call from members to connect libraries who are collecting COVID-19 stories. A recent Content DM Community Center webinar brought together a panel of archivists and librarians sharing their insights on how they are collecting information, oral histories, and other objects about the COVID-19 pandemic to share with current and future generations. A common thread amongst all the panelists was the commitment to collect. In the statement developed by the International Council on Archives, it states the duty to document does not cease in a crisis. It becomes even more essential. And in this moment of high activity, it is imperative that, we, that decisions be documented, that records and data be secured and preserved in all sectors, and that the security and preservation and access to digital content be facilitated and prioritized. Sarah Cogley, the digital archivist at the State University of New York at Buffalo noted that by collecting and preserving these perspectives, the university archives supports the research mission of the university, allowing future students, researchers and scholars to study the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic an undoubtedly transformative event in the history of student life and the academic experience here at UB. This sentiment was echoed by her fellow panelists who also provided detailed information about workflows, resources, and other points of guidance for those interested in collecting their community stories about COVID-19. The webinar is recorded and open for viewing at the URL noted here. Learning from sharing and sharing as we learn is a powerful way to expand our knowledge and sharpen our skills. OCLC's Research Library Partnership with its transnational network of over 130 academic libraries is a program that uses this effective model of active peer learning. Over the past 40 years, RLP's convenings of workings and interest groups have generated ideas and innovations that have positively impacted operational practice. Despite the disruptive effect of COVID-19, the RLP has continued to convene and sustain its trust network responding to the need that although we are working apart, there is a great demand for connection. Marilee Prophet, the Senior Manager at OCLC's Research Library Partnership, is here to tell us more. Marilee? Thank you, Rachel. As background for the types of convenings and conversations we've been holding, I want to tell you a little bit about the OCLC Research Library Partnership. At its heart, the OCLC RLP is made up of people, our activities are led by an energetic team who work with member institutions to develop an array of programming for both senior library leaders and staff. The primary form of that engagement is and always has been virtual. Here are some of our team members. Like you, we have been working from home for the last few months. But the OCLC RLP is not just made up of OCLC research staff. There are hundreds of staff members at partner institutions that we interact with on a regular basis. As part of our regular ongoing practices, our group hosts and facilitates lively virtual professional development opportunities for staff at partner institutions within or across our four key areas of focus. And those areas of focus are research support, special collections, research sharing, and of course, a long and strong program of work with metadata. Within each of these areas, we convene groups regularly. These groups meet virtually and on a regular cadence. But when March happened, when COVID-19 happened, we shifted to support library workers and meet them in a new point of need. So I want to share with you now what we are hearing and learning within two of our established focus areas. These two areas, resource sharing and research support have substantially pivoted to accommodate the discussions that people need to have now to support work in this moment. These have both evolved to be regular discussions or town halls for library staff to share experiences, adaptations to services, transformations to workflow processes. I should note that the OCLC RLP represents a diverse group of institutions. We are a transnational group and 
the membership really cuts across library types. So we have a good number of museum libraries in the mix, for example. Hours after the World Health Organization's pandemic declaration on March 11th, Senior Program Officer Dennis Massey sent an email to the resource sharing arm of the RLP, SHARES, asking how they were coping with the changes coming at them from their home institutions. By morning, responses had flooded his inbox, reflecting resource sharing challenges and expectations ex being experienced by staff and administrators everywhere. Responding quickly to this initial wave of disruption, Dennis continued to field emails and compiled responses, and he also set up virtual discussions for this group. The remarkable story of those first few turbulent weeks is documented in a blog post on Hanging Together. Since March, these town halls have evolved to biweekly occurrences with robust attendance of around 40 participants. So in these town halls, practitioners come together to pool uncertainties, share new workflows, favorite resources, and to ask questions of one another. Discussions have covered topics on such top-of-mind issues as planning for the resumption of on-premise activities, managing the inevitable influx of returned books, the safe handling of packages and physical materials, and envisioning ways that we can utilize analytics for e-resources during the pandemic to re-engage with publishers and content providers. And of course, strategies for coping with uncertainty, stress, and isolation brought on by this crisis. So it's a privilege to work alongside longstanding communities of practice that are steeped in establishing trust with one another. This group has really worked through many difficult issues in the past, and the trust and reliance on one another really shows through in moments like this. The group has really talked a lot about the human aspects of working from home, and in an effort to kind of alleviate stress, in May, the SHARES participants began gathering for virtual weekly social half hours on Friday afternoons in order to get better acquainted, introduce their pets, discuss favorite snacks and beverages, and generally unwind. Senior Program Officer Rebecca Bryant and Senior Research Scientist Brian Lavoy have been convening quarterly conversations for some time around the challenges of research support in libraries. As with our resource sharing area, they have accelerated the pace of these virtual discussions and have been convening COVID-19 check-in conversations. While the resource sharing journey in research libraries resembled a crazy roller coaster ride with lots of dips and turns, the research support conversations revealed the abrupt and complete stop in university research on campus. Participants in these discussions talked about the priority that the library experienced in helping to get courses online quickly. So a lot of library focus there. Although the library's physical closure meant a drop in access to some services, there was also an increase in other services, such as streaming online content, virtual chat reference services, and access to digitized versions of print content through the Hottie Trust Emergency Library. We also learned that participants were keeping in touch with colleagues on a multiplicity of platforms. No surprise there. And we also heard a lot about the importance of existing networks for support. So people are really leaning on one another and, and deepening their existing networks of support in order to sustain themselves through this time. As with the shares conversations, we heard a lot about the need for care for oneself and for others. A particularly heartening story of care involves Leonard the turtle, who's pictured here, who needed a home when the University of Minnesota Natural Resources Library had to close its physical doors. Librarian Jan Franzen and her family took Leonard in, sparing her an uncertain fate. And yes, Leonard the turtle is in fact a girl. You can now follow Leonard's adventures on Instagram at hardcoveredleonard. Even amidst the unusual circumstances, there's really quite a bit to be positive about. It is both exciting and inspiring to see how colleagues have been flexible and adaptive, 
pivoting to online, embracing telework, and improvising ways to sustain access to library resources. Colleagues are really willing to think outside the box to find solutions. One participant shared this Shackleton quote that Rachel referenced earlier, optimism is true moral courage. The prevailing theme across these discussions was optimism and dedication in the face of lingering uncertainty about the future. Since we are a transnational group spanning several continents, we are even seeing the glimmers of reopening in locations such as New Zealand. And we know that these experiences will lead to even greater insights and wisdom to be shared in the group. And again, summaries of these discussions can be found on our blog, Hanging Together. As Rachel mentioned, the demand for professional development and coming together is particularly strong right now. Within the RLP, we have an ongoing webinar series to help partners share the great work that's emerging at their institutions, and attendance at these webinars has been robust, to say the least. Within our metadata managers group, a response to the topic metadata management in times of uncertainty generated a whopping 58 pages of text which is a new record for a question set in the 28-year history of this particular focus group. Again, it is such a privilege for all of us to work with smart, committed, engaged, and thoughtful professionals, and the feeling is apparently mutual. One of our partners called our convenings out as being particularly valuable, saying that what we offer is no less than a lifeline to the outside world. So it's really great to know that we're of service, but it's even better to hear it directly. The conversations that we've been having in the OCLC RLP, as well as one that we observe in other networks, reveal that there are two strong demands within the library community at this time. The first is, of course, the need for immediate guidance about resuming on-premise activities and operations. And the second is a desire to know what should libraries be thinking about now in order to be in a position of strength in the next 12 to 18 months? So it's these two thoughts that have really guided OCLC in developing two new research projects, the Realm Project and the New Model Library. I'm going to hand things off now to Sharon Streams, Director of Web Junction, who will talk about the first of these projects, which will give libraries the knowledge to plan and adapt for the future. Take it away, Sharon. Thanks, Marilee. Starting in early March, libraries across the country closed their physical buildings to the public and limited their services to online only in response to their community's efforts to flatten the curve of COVID-19 transmission. Now it's June and communities across the country are in various stages of reopening. When I recorded this video a few weeks ago, only a few libraries were open but many others were planning to do so in the coming weeks to meet local demand for services or to follow late local or statewide directives. Because the COVID-19 public health crisis is still in effect and is expected to be for an unknown length of time, library administrators are seeking authoritative science-based information to inform their decisions on how to reduce the risk of transmission of COVID-19 to staff and visitors who are engaging in the delivery or the use of their services. While the CDC has provided general guidance for handling materials and reducing the spread of infection in the workplace, libraries are concerned about their heavily circulated collection items and the frequently touched items in their public spaces. According to IMLS data, in 2016, there were nearly 2 billion circulations of physical items from public library collections and books compose more than half of those circulated materials. And that's just the public libraries. It's daunting to consider the total usage of the tens of thousands of academic, school, and special libraries and collections across the country and the world. There are also about 35,000 museums across the country. These institutions preserve and protect more than a billion objects. There are about 850 million museum visits in a typical year, including 55 million visits from school children coming to the museum in groups. The staff and conservators of art, history, and children's museums, historical sites, science centers, and other exhibition spaces are also seeking authoritative scientific evidence 
to inform protocols for handling a wide variety of collection materials and exhibits, and to make decisions about how and when to resume public visits and interaction with objects, exhibits, sites, and spaces. In response to this urgent need, the Institute of Museum and Library Services has activated a partnership with OCLC and the scientific research company Battelle to produce research on how long the COVID-19 coronavirus survives on materials that are prevalent in our libraries and museums, and how materials might be handled to mitigate exposure to staff and visitors. Both Battelle and OCLC are headquartered in the Columbus, Ohio area, and Columbus Metropolitan Library has donated sample collection items to be used as testing subjects for the research. This research partnership has named the project Realm, which stands for Reopening Archives, Libraries, and Museums. Project activities started at the end of April. OCLC is responsible for executing project deliverables and guiding the scope of work of Battelle. I am the project director for OCLC, and our team includes expertise from across our membership and research division and our OCLC communications team. The Realm Project has been provided with an executive project steering committee, a scientific working group, and an operations working group, which offer additional expertise and insights for the project partners. We've also created a communication network of member associations and organizations that serve the library, archives, and museum professions, all of which are working together to help distribute information and updates from the project. Over the coming months, the project will produce a toolkit of resources that leverages the input from the committees, literature reviews, and the results of Battelle's emerging laboratory research. The, these toolkit resources may take on a variety of formats, including templates, infographics, demonstration videos, or downloadable files. This project is designed to be flexible and to evolve as more becomes known about the virus and in response to the overall trajectory of the pandemic and public health response. The partnership will address known and emergent research questions in three phases over 17 months. Phase one of the project, which started in May, is focused on supporting public libraries that are reopening over the summer. During this phase, Battelle has been collecting, reviewing, and summarizing both emerging and existing coronavirus and COVID-19 specific research related to these following questions. One, how might the virus spread through public library general operations? Two, how long does the virus survive on material surfaces through environmental attenuation? And three, how effective are various prevention and decontamination measures that are re readily available to public libraries in the near term? In addition to the scientific literature review, OCLC and working group members have been collecting and curating plans, workflows, and protocols from a range of institutional type sizes and locations, both here in the US and abroad. For the laboratory testing, Battelle is studying how long the COVID-19 virus survives on a selection of materials that are prevalent in and frequently handled in public libraries. Those materials include the buckram cloth cover of a hard cover book, the cover of a soft cover book, the paper pages from inside of a book, the plastic protective cover of a book, and a DVD case. By the time you're watching this video, this first set of lab testing should be complete. Now, as Battelle has frequently reminded us, you can't rush good science, but we hope that we have great results to share this month. These phase one research and information gathering activities will help us produce this initial set of toolkit resources, and we'll publish that on the Realm website and distribute it through that network of association and, and other communication channels. In phase two, which overlaps phase one, we'll be studying additional materials and workflows that are prevalent across not just libraries, but archives and special collections and museums of many types. Additional lab testing will be performed and the toolkit resources will be expanded and updated to reflect the emerging results. In the phase three, which begins this fall, 
We will continue to monitor and review emerging resource research that may require updates and additions to what has been created during the first two phases. If you haven't already, I encourage you to sign up to receive project updates by email. Go to the Realm website by following the link here and sign up for that mailing list. This is the best way to learn about late breaking news and information from Realm as quickly as possible. You can also follow OCLC on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn for the latest project updates and join the conversation using the hashtag Realm Project. I'm gonna now hand it over to Lynn Silipinia conway OCLC Director of Library Trends and User Research. Lynn's gonna talk about how new library models uh, may emerge as libraries are seeking opportunities to make positive long-term change. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you for joining us today. I'm very happy to be here with you uh, even in this virtual environment. And as you, our colleagues, are working diligently to create and maintain the daily activities of a library in this new environment, we at OCLC Research think that the most useful contribution we can make is to talk to global library leaders to identify your visions for the new library models that will emerge as you look at opportunities for converting your short-term responses to the COVID-19 pandemic into positive long-term change. We have been engaging in discussions with public and national librarians, as well as academic librarians from community colleges, four-year colleges, and university and research institutions. We have brought these discussions together under a new project called the New Model Library with the goal of understanding how the circumstances of this pandemic and library responses will shape services, service models, and collections in the post-pandemic environment. And so what's this all about? It's all about innovation and how you as a library community have innovated. You have been making resources available during community and campus shutdowns with most activities transitioning to an online environment. You have been moving from a blended approach of providing resources, services, and programming to a completely online approach. Many of you are structuring your services and programs so staff are able to attend to users' needs remotely. You are implementing video software for information literacy instruction, virtual reference and programming, such as story times, classes, and author talks. You are exploring the same and maybe different personal delivery um, methods of materials. Um, you have library drive-ups. Some have had them before, some have just created them. Uh, you have different pickup modes. I know with my public library that I just have used this week, um, I just call them and I drive up and they deliver the materials to me. Um, you have bookmobiles, also practicing social distancing, other delivery services, mail, FedEx. You're retraining staff and shifting staff responsibilities. You are rethinking subscription models consortial borrowing policies, purchasing and resource sharing and ILL services. You're building collections remotely, often turning over the whole collection development to many of your users. They may select items and have them delivered to their homes. Stephen Riccio currently wrote, be less task focused and more people focused in this time. And I think that's very critical um, to be thinking more about developing relationships and also to work with others and be more flexible and compassionate as we have been doing. When we were talking to a chief executive officer of a large metropolitan public library in North America, um, she started talking about the collaborations and partnerships that were developed through COVID-19. And she said that, I think 
That is the beauty of virtual. It is much easier to share. I think that will become more prevalent going forward. Um, many of you may be familiar with our project, the Digital Visitors and Residents. This is a copy of our cover from one of our reports, The Many Faces of Digital Visitors and Residents, which many of you have been involved in. And we have a, a framework that we call the Visitors and Residents Framework. And a visitor is an individual who logs onto the virtual environment, performs a specific task, or acquires specific information, and then logs off. So use this technology and the internet as a tool. A resident is an individual who has an ongoing developing presence online. That is an individual who leaves traces, who is very much at home in this online environment. Most of us can be a hybrid and say, it depends. Um, I may be a resident in this situation, and I may be a, a visitor in this other situation. However, in today's environment, are people who are normally visitors forced to become residents? Will this persist in the post-pandemic era? Or will we go back to more of these hybrid models or visitor models? If so, will most of our services and programs need to be adapted to the online environment? And how will we, or can we, or should we, create experiences similar to the physical spaces in our libraries and our virtual library spaces? Well, when talking to many of you, we've received some great comments. This is a comment made when discussing the changes implemented because of the pandemic at a four-year college library in North America. And it is from the university librarian who said, the library is not just a place over there. The library is all around us. It is where you need to be wherever you are. Now this brings us to placing the library in the life of the user. We have had several projects that have addressed this. And that means that we as librarians need to be sure that we are where our users are working based on their experiences in everyday life. Now, oddly enough, uh, the library and the life of the user is not a recent term or a recent thought. It was coined by Doug Zweizig in 1973 in his dissertation. However, the environment in 1973 was very different than the environment today. Yes, this is still is extremely relevant to us. Now, Patrick Lencioni, who is a consultant who really works with team building, he had a quote not long ago, and he said, we will either emerge better or worse from this crisis. Now, you may think that's not so profound. However, it is because we can try to make this to be something that is better. We believe libraries will emerge better. A CEO of a large urban public library in North America said to us in one of our discussions that there are silver linings that will come from this experience. And she even gave us several examples of those silver linings. This is a quote from Eric Kleinenberg and he wrote Palaces for the People, where he talks about the public library as a place within society. And he said, the coronavirus pandemic could help us rediscover the better version of ourselves. And I do believe that. And the new model library project is an opportunity to identify a better version of libraries based on changes made to accommodate a new way of life. This is a quote from the head librarian at a community college in North America 
when talking about the changes that had to be made very quickly because of the pandemic. And she said, if we weren't pushed, we would be doing smoke signals with the students. And she was referring to the fact that at this community college, the library was very much a physical place. And there was a lot of inter um, communication and activities uh, within the physical library. And they were very hesitant to move on into this virtual environment. But she said they had to make changes uh, within two days and move from this uh, physical space into a virtual place for their students and faculty. And, and that really forced them to think differently and to try some things they may have been more hesitant to try. And so I just want to leave you today again with this idea of the new model library, which is identifying a better version of libraries based on changes made to accommodate a new way of life. And I'd like to leave today with a quote from Charles Dickens from A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. Yes, we have been experiencing all of these things and maybe more. We are experiencing an exceptional time in our lives that requires compassion and flexibility, a time for us as librarians to focus on our community's needs and each other during this difficult time. This is evident in the numerous engagement activities that were shared here today. What we're doing right now by sharing our thoughts in this virtual video medium is part of an evolution that's been going on in some ways for thousands of years. And in many ways for only a decade or so. From writing to printing to mass media, from photography to one way video and now video conferencing, it's all matching content to containers as we've pointed out in some of our research here. Sometimes we found the container doesn't matter. Students just want answers immediately and don't care if it's a journal, book, or database. Other times, well, our whole paradigm shifts in an instant when we can't get to our physical spaces, to entire categories of containers because of something like the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition to content and containers, my work often has touched on the subject of digital visitors and residents. A digital visitor is someone who is comfortable with digital tools, but only may use them for specific activities or to satisfy an immediate need. A digital resident is someone whose job or life activities are deeply embedded in one or more digital environments. What we've seen is that when millions of digital visitors are forced to stay at home in their own physical residences, they are venturing out to become more comfortable as digital residents. It is as if a kind of migration is taking place, similar to an, env an environmental catastrophe of the past, when tribes or nations would flee a flood or drought. Vast numbers of students, workers, children and teachers are moving more and more parts of their lives online. What do libraries do when residents move in? We meet them. We find out what questions they have. We provide the answers they need, same as it ever was. Public libraries have done this for waves of immigrants from new parts of the globe expanding across access based on language needs. We've done it when industries and economies have changed, adding job and employment resources. We've done it during times of health crises and natural disasters. Academic libraries have done it as new groups of students joined the workforce and new types of education became available. Research libraries expanded their services 
to include new areas of study, new technology, new support staff and expertise. This new wave of digital resident will need a different kind of library, one we're calling the new model library. Whatever happens after COVID-19, we know that some number of these new digital residents will not be moving back. They will be more comfortable learning and communicating online. Their jobs, their schools, their universities will be providing more digital options. They will want libraries that support those choices. And for some of them, the library will be the only place where they will be fully digitally at home. We already are seeing new cracks in the digital divide. Laptops, smartphones, and home Wi-Fi that may work fine for casual or entertainment purposes, that may work for one adult as he or she check email or do minimal web surfing will not be enough to support a full family of digital residents. These people may need to live at your library for a time. I don't mean this literally, of course, but we all knew children, maybe you were that child, who didn't have access to books at home. And we say of them lovingly that they lived at the library when they were young. That will hold true for some of these new digital residents and the new model library. They will find their home with you as they learn to navigate a world where school, work, and life is more online than ever before. This, I believe, is a wonderful opportunity for us. We already are very good at these things. We as librarians are good at sharing. We are good at learning. We are good at virtual and electronic. Now we have to just be even better and more purposeful as we help these new digital residents find shore footing on the digital shores we've prepared for them. I would like to thank all of the presenters today and to you for joining in and watching.